Hey everybody, it's Alex and Ben. Welcome back to the Oregon Bridge. Reviving Oregon's civic culture. I think that's a responsibility of anyone who pursues elected office. I do think our civic culture is in trouble. I do think it's a shell of what it used to be. I do think Oregonians are deeply pessimistic about our ability to solve big problems. That is a problem for all of us as a state, and it's a particular problem for our government and for the Democrats who are in charge of our government. And I hope to be one. We need to do work to try to build a more unified culture in terms of our, our politics and our, our civic space. And that's really hard. Hey everyone, welcome. We're just gonna dive right into the episode because today we have the most special of guests. We have my <laughs> co-host, Ben Bowman, as a special guest. And Ben, we'll ask you the question we ask everybody. How are you doing today? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great way to start a podcast. I'm doing really well. Uh, although I will say it is pouring down rain and it, you know, it's what, what time is it? It's 11.15, but it looks like it's about 7.30 at night. So uh, Oregon Fall is here. I also heard it was going to rain like 12 inches in like uh, Lake Shasta area. So we're, we're going to get pummeled on the West Coast with rain. But that's a good thing. I'm happy about that. Yeah, and my, my wife's friend is here from Florida because she wants to do all of the nature sort of Oregon stuff. Uh, <laughs> and they're actually hiking today in, in Silver Lake. And I was like, you shouldn't do this. It's supposed to be like historic <laughs> wind, lots of rain. And she's like, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. I'm like, I've, I lived here for a long time. <laughs> that, know, like, that will be an have, authentic, have fun. But. That will be an authentic Oregonian experience. It'll actually be probably super fun and they'll remember it for the rest of their lives. and It'll be great, but they'll come home very cold and wet. That's true. It's going to be like, uh, it's going to be like kids playing in mud. So I guess <laughs> though when you're almost 30, but, uh, but so Ben, we are here today because you recently announced that you are running for the open house seat, the new open house seat, which I am correct is House District 25, which encompasses most of Tigard and then a little bit of the Tualatin area as well. Uh, so Not we're interviewing Walton. you today. Beaverton. Oh, Beaverton. Okay. Yeah. yeah you, you bet. I said I was actually testing you to make sure that you knew that. So <laughs> I hope I passed. That would have been the slip up to end the run. Right there. <laughs> it would have literally been over. Uh, thousands of people would have jumped in. <laughs> uh, but so you have openly declared uh, for this for this House district, and you are the only Democrat that is running so far. Uh, I don't actually even know if there's any Republicans who have declared for this so far. So you're literally the only candidate who has jumped in. How are things going, right? I mean, you're, if I'm not mistaken, there was a Willamette Weekly article, which basically said a new House seat has opened up with an with no incumbent and has its first candidate. So it's not like there's an incumbent who had the seat before and they're running for it. Uh, what's it been like? How's it going? A lot, I imagine a lot of people have been paying attention to this. Yeah, um, I was a little bit surprised at how closely the media um, or some in the media were paying attention to it. And I think so there's an article in Willamette Week, there's an article in Portland Tribune, there's an article in Oregon Capital Chronicle, and there's an article coming out in Tigard Life magazine, which many of our listeners might not be familiar with, but that's the one of the local papers in Tigard. And I think part of the reason is I think I was the first candidate to announce post redistricting. Um, which was an interesting angle for people to write about. And it is a unique situation where our incumbent state representative, which is Dacia Graber, a friend of the, friend of the pod, who uh, folks should listen to that episode if they haven't. It's one of our best listened to episodes, actually. Um, but she got redistricted into a district that is all Southwest Portland. So the previous Tiger District was like most of Tiger and then a chunk of like outer Southwest Portland where Dacia lives. And she got put into a district. Her district's really cool now. It's got PSU, OHSU, it goes down to the South Waterfront. And so the new dividing line is basically the Multnomah County, Washington County line. So everything south of Multnomah County um, in the city of Tigard, plus Southridge High School on the east, um, and then Progress Ridge uh, further down on the east. And then we go along Bull Mountain Road. Um, so there's no incumbent in the district. And um, I talked a little bit to Rep. Graber. I talked to my former boss, Rep. Doherty, but the two previous people who represented this area in the legislature. And uh, I decided I was going to jump in and jump in quickly and try to build a strong campaign. And yeah, so far, it's been going really, really well. Knock on wood. And so I want to step back just a second with that, because uh, you and I, of course, have been doing this podcast now for uh, what have we been doing this for like eight months? And generally we have people come on the podcast, both on the right, on the left, on the center. And we ask them, uh, I wouldn't say our questions are too hard, but some of them are certainly not easy to answer. They may 
put people in, you know, uncomfortable positions politically, or they're just hard questions, right? I mean, Oregon, it's, you know, we're dealing with a lot of hard public policy issues. Uh, you are now finally on the other end of the spectrum with that, right? You've had these media articles, these media profiles, uh, people are paying attention to what you're saying. They might even be listening to this podcast in past episodes to see sort of what you're saying, what your view on and specific issues. What has it been like to kind of have, I don't want to say the tables turn because that seems, uh, it seems like there's something uh, nefarious going on there, but like what, what's it been like to sort of not just not just with the media attention, right? But like people are kind of paying attention to you a little bit more now. Maybe they're diving in a little bit more to your life. What's that kind of been like? I mean, so I ran for school board um, and won that election. And then I ran for the state Senate um, last cycle in 2020. So it, it's like, the, it's it's not different than that. I will say like, I think it's a lot more fun to be like designing the the show notes and like trying to, you know, craft a discussion that will be interesting. Like you, there is, you do worry about saying the wrong thing or like saying something that you didn't mean to say or the words not coming out properly. And then it like, you know, I even want like, have I said something stupid on this podcast? Probably, you know, that someone could come back and be like, oh, but Ben Bowman in episode four of the Oregon Bridge said this thing about whatever. So like you did- that, that would be how we know we've made it. You know? like <laughs> yeah. In episode four, minute 13. <laughs> So like, I mean, I don't know, like people, to be honest, people are not paying that close attention to a race like mine, I'm guessing. Um, some people are, but like the p average public is not, I would say like the average voter in Tigard is probably still not fully aware of redistricting and what that meant for them and that they're going to have a new state rep. And um, like, I think this is a low, this is, you know, it's a state office, right? It's state legislature. So in my view, it's a super important job with a really significant responsibility, but it's not a congressional seat or the governor's race where like people are paying opposition researchers to go learn everything that this, you know, a candidate has ever done to try to use it against them. Um, I will say like, I do think what I've enjoyed about the podcast is I feel like we've been able to explore what we think are the most important trends in Oregon politics and national politics to some extent and talk to the people who are living it and making the decisions that kind of drive how it looks in the state. And so I am excited about potentially joining those ranks and like being part of that group of people who tries to like chart our course through the challenges we're facing. So that part is really exciting. And um, yeah, I like, I think it's going, it's going well so far, but not a super surprise. Like I am a, the school board chair in Tiger Twalton. So like, people watch our school board meetings <laughs> and we hear from them with criticisms, with um, praise, with questions all the time. So this is kind of like that, but at a different scale. Yeah. And so, uh, no, 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 that, that, that definitely is true. I, uh, and I'm sort of curious cause you, if I'm not mistaken, declared October 4th. Uh, so when this podcast actually comes out, you will have basically been running for office for, uh, Almost a month, yeah, basically four weeks. Uh, what does the process actually look like in terms of running for office? And I don't mean filing the paperwork or finding someone who can be your legal treasurer. Like you have declared your intent to run for office. You filed the necessary paperwork or whatever you've done. Maybe you haven't even done that yet, I guess, because the new districts aren't even out. But what does the actual process look like? Like, are you are you just knocking on doors? Are you, you know, meeting with uh, influencers or meeting with interest groups or whatever? Like, what, what does that kind of look like in terms of like, if you're a candidate for, you know, a state house district? This is a very risky move. I'm going to reveal the secret playbook and people could, could use this to torpedo my campaign. Um, no, this is, it's like a poorly, it, these are poorly kept secrets that aren't even really secrets. People really know. So this early in a campaign you don't usually, usually, you don't usually knock on doors. Um, you don't usually do direct voter contact. So you're not calling people, you're not paying for mail pieces, you're not knocking on doors. And the basic reason is like, again, voters are not engaged or paying attention to a 2022 election in, you know, fall of 2021. So what you're trying to do is all the other stuff to build a strong campaign structure. So for me, my biggest focus has been on like basically two fronts, getting endorsements um, and raising money, um, which as our listeners know from previous episodes, Oregon is a state, uh, this is crazy, but it is true. Oregon is a state where you can raise as much money as you want from 
as few or as many people as you want in contribution sizes as big or as small as you want. So literally you could accept a contribution for $5 million from Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos could give you $10 million or whatever. Like there's literally no restrictions. So unfortunately for me, I do not have those relationships with people who can write that, those big of checks. So like, I think on the local person, like if you, you can see, go to my website, benfororegon.com and you can see like my endorsements are really strong right now. Like most of the elected office holders who are Democrats in my area, you know, the mayor, the city council president, my colleagues on the school board, the Metro counselor, the Democrats on the Washington County commission, um, you know, legislators from around the area, et cetera, et cetera. Like I've got the support of all those people. I've been building out those endorsements to like more state um, level um, people. Like, so I've got the attorney general's endorsement. I've got the labor commissioner's endorsement. So those are all really strong. So the goal is basically like keep building those out. Um, and I've got like, you know, I've been around in Oregon politics long enough, basically, you know, for almost 10 years now. That, like, I, I, actually, wait, I want to I want to jump in and ask about the endorsements piece, yeah. uh, because uh, to me, this is something that that's, that's really interesting. So the uh, I would say, at least on the Republican side of the aisle, right, everybody, no matter what level of office you are, for the most part, wants an endorsement from President Trump. That's considered <laughs> like you get an endorsement from Trump, you're going to do great in the primary. Right. Uh, now, obviously, and let's even say, right, if you were endorsed by Joe Biden, President Biden, that would be like a big boon for your campaign. What, what sort of the value besides, obviously, there's some like direct marketing there, right? If you can say, oh, I'm endorsed by all these progressive leaders, or all these Democrats, that's, that, that's sort of great. But like, what does someone actually, like, what sort of the value add to the campaign? I know you're endorsed by Oregon's Attorney General, right? That's, to me, at least a pretty big endorsement. What's sort of like the value out of that besides maybe just like slapping her name on a mail piece or something? Like, is it, do they like help campaign for you? Or like, what does what that kind of process, like what does the endorsement actually mean? Besides just like, you know, I endorse Ben, you should vote for him. That's a good question. And I think the answer is uh, my, my, one of my high school teachers, my high school business teacher was named Bob Marling. And Bob Marling used to say that the correct answer to any complex question is always, it depends. <laughs> so like it, in this case, some of my endorsers, I think will like, like campaign with me and they'll like, like do direct voter outreach for me and they'll like post on their Facebook pages and they'll talk to their friends about me. And those are mostly the local folks like who live in the district and have a vested interest in who represents the district. Uh, but for some of the bigger ones and like legislators outside the district, some folks like they probably won't do anything. Um, and not because like they don't care, but just because like, you know, they've got their own races to run. They're not from the area. Yeah. Um, but so for someone like Attorney General Rosenblum, like she is someone who I would probably put in the voters pamphlet, um, which is like, as probably most of our listeners know, like every voter gets a voters pamphlet statement where all the candidates get, you know, like a half a page to talk about their experiences, their platform, who's supporting them. So I think like that's one one thing at the early stage, like frankly, what you're trying to do is paint a picture. What I'm trying to do is like paint a picture of myself as a community leader who's got broad support where I live and across the state to be effective in the job. Like that's what I'm, that's the picture I'm trying to paint with my endorsements. And I think that's why having some of those bigger folks are helpful, but like, and there's different theories on this, but like, I think one of the reasons I beat an incumbent when I ran for school board was because I didn't come in with like state I didn't have I, I don't know if I listed any endorsements outside of the school district boundaries like I had the mayors of all the cities I had city councilors I did had, they did they have statewide endorsements the people I was running against yeah uh one of them had state legislators yeah and, re, and like okay regional, interesting regional elected officials um but like I just kept it focused on local so like the reason I bring that up is like I think voters tend to they tend to care more about like like I don't know like I could go back and forth on this but what do we think the average name recognition of a school board member or city councilor is in a district it's like really low very low 100 <laughs> percent yeah uh actually like, yeah well actually, well actually one thing about name recognition too that I find interesting I think this was I forgot if this was the 2016 actually no this was the 2020 election and this was right as the democratic primary was sort of coming to an end there was a poll that showed that like 
20% of Americans didn't even know who Mike Pence was, <laughs> uh, which to me is crazy. And there was even a certain number of people who didn't know who Donald Trump was like at that time. I don't I mean, buy that. Like, I think yeah, I, I, I feel like that's survey. probably BS. Like, how do you yeah. not see with all the media and stuff like that? But even as you were saying, just going down to the micro level, like I'm assuming that like 15% of name recognition for like a really local office holder is like probably pretty good, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, but but so people don't know like the flip side is people don't know the names necessarily, but they know the positions, they know the titles. So like, they might not know, they might not be able to picture Jason Snyder in their brain, but they know that the mayor of Tiger is an important job. And like for Ellen Rosenblum, we might ask someone, you know, what she has, I think the greatest name recognition. And there've been some polls that show she's got the greatest name recognition of quote, potential governor candidates. She's, she has not declared she's running, but in polls that like we're looking at who might run. Um, so people might not be able to name Ellen Rosenblum as the attorney general, but they might remember or know, oh, our attorney general sued the Trump administration several times. And so by me having her support, it might help them see like, I'm not a Trump supporter. Like I oppose Trump and his policies. Like I'll be a progressive leader. Um, mm -hmm. and I think like, like, again, voters, and I've learned this on the school board for sure. Voters are not super clear about like, okay, we even talked about this with Commissioner Jayapal. So where does this legislature's responsibility end and the county's responsibilities begin? And what about Metro Council? And then you've got these like other- Confuses districts. me still. Yeah, it's like not super straightforward. So again, like you're just trying to paint a picture to voters about who are you, who are you, what are your values? What do you believe in? Who are the type of people who support you? And I think that's kind of like the broad strategy on endorsements. We went really deep on endorsements just there. Oh, I know it's it's all it's something that 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 interests me for sure. So, okay, so yeah, and I actually uh, we'll go back to that or, or something along that in, in just a second. But uh, before we get into that, uh, want to ask a little bit about the race in itself. Okay, yeah. so from my understanding, uh, I know that the district is is very heavily partisan on the Democratic side of things. I think it's something like plus 20 or not, not even more than that. Yes. Or, or sorry, maybe even more than that. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of the primary election really matters the most, right? Because uh, whoever the poor Republican, if you even have a Republican candidate who you have to go up against, they, uh, they're very much fighting an, an uphill battle against yes. you. Uh, so what are some of the primary issues that you're trying to focus your campaign on? Maybe let's, obviously you could talk about a basketful. So maybe we'll just focus on two. What do you think that the two sort of most pressing issues are that you're going to focus on with your campaign? That's a good question. So I would, so the district I think is like, demo, it's got like a 25 to 30 point democratic registration advantage, which basically means like whoever wins the primary is incredibly likely to win the general absent, like a major intervention of money scandal, something. It's just like, would be almost unheard of for a Democrat to lose a seat. That's D plus 30, I think. Yeah, um, I actually, so I was reading about this. There was like one Louisiana Democrat who lost, I think in 2010, to a Republican in like a plus 30 D district. And it was like the level of scandal that took place for that to happen was like astronomical. Right. <laughs> Basically. So. Right. so like, yeah, very unlikely to happen possible, but unlikely to happen. So, I mean, like, and you, so I wouldn't actually call the district partisan. Like it is strongly democratic, but like these are like Tiger is a suburb, right? Tiger is not inner Southeast Portland. Um, like there's different, I would say different values, we have a lot of, um, you know, like, like Tiger is a place, it's, it's, it's a place where you go to raise a family. Um, people care about, I think ed education for me has always been a top policy priority. Like regardless of what I do professionally, it's likely that I'll have something to do with education or education policy. So that will pr probably be my top, top issue. Like I'm a school board member. I got my master's degree in education policy. I work for the department of ed when I was in, um, when I worked for Rep Doherty in the legislature, she was chair of the House Ed Committee. So I've been around these issues for a long time. Um, so I, I think focusing on education will be a priority. There's there's some like technical wonky things I want to do that are probably not super interesting to talk about, including current service level and like the quality education model and how we think about education funding. A bigger priority issue is um, early learning, preschool expansion. I really like what um, I was just telling Titus, I was recently endorsed by 
um, Multnomah County Commissioner Jessica Vega Peterson, who is basically the leader who started Preschool for All in Multnomah County and started with the task force and built out the public support. They ran a campaign and now um, soon, eventually, uh, Multnomah County will be providing preschool for all kids, which is a really, really big deal, um, not just for those kids and families, but for the region and for the state. Um, there's going to be significant economic benefits there. So like the balance here, like the under the hood balance that like I think is good to talk about in a podcast form is I'm going to be a if I win, knock on wood, which is a big if like I'm going to be a freshman legislator, uh, which means mm. I'm not going to be the most powerful person in the room. Um, and in fact, I'll be at the bottom end of power and influence in terms of determining a agenda. And my, my former boss, Margaret Doherty, used to talk about how like you're going to vote on bills on a million different subjects, healthcare, transportation, housing, education, you know, emergency management, preparedness, veterans issues, et cetera. And you can't be expected to master all of those things. So um, you sort of specialize in an area and then you learn as much as you can from your colleagues who are sort of specialists in these other areas. And I do think like I would likely be, I would, I would ask to serve on the ed house education committee um, and focus on education policy issues. So that's one long answer. The, the other issue, I don't know if I could boil it down to one. There's some issues that are, I think, specific to Tigard and specific to the region that are really important. Um, the, uh, so housing, affordable housing is a very big deal. There's a situation in Tigard right now um, with the Wood Spring Apartments. This is actually crazy. So, and people should know about this because this is going to be a really big policy issue for the region more like and and I think probably the state I don't actually know the details I need to learn more but essentially there's a affordable housing complex called the Wood Spring Apartments I actually live very close to it like I when we had there was a a rally there of, um, a couple weeks ago and I could walk to it from my house it's affordable housing for senior citizens so these are people who are very much on a fixed income and who would seriously struggle in as you know as someone who's trying to buy their first home alex it's a bonkers horrible housing, it's a bonkers <laughs> housing market so what it, when these when many of these affordable housing complexes were built they were built with 30 year commitments to maintain affordable housing status which there is a legal definition of like how you are how you become considered affordable housing mm -hmm. but at the end of that 30 year commitment, the owners have the right to transition it back to quote unquote market rate housing. Well, transitioning Woodspring to market rate would force dozens, if not hundreds of tenants out into the streets to figure out where to go next. And if you talk to these folks, they literally have no idea where they would go. Some of them might try to move in with family. Some of them would just get forced way out wherever they can find affordable housing, which is certainly not the, the Portland metro area right now. Um, and this is happening not just in Tigard, but there's many of these complexes around the area. So I think we need to do something about affordable housing. I use Woodspring as a specific example, but obviously it's affecting young families um, just as much as um, elderly folks. There's a bunch of transportation challenges um, specific to Tigard and to the region. Um, the uh, Southwest Corridor project is um, well reported. I'm sure folks are familiar with um, that proposal. And there's a lot of layers of government involved here with Metro and TriMet and the federal government and the state government and matching funds, et cetera. Um, but, but essentially that what our region would like to see is light rail go to Bridgeport village um, for folks who've been there that connects with um, downtown Portland. And then there's, there's orphan highways, which folks probably don't know about, which uh, are essentially like highways that are owned by the state, but not being kept up and in essentially in disrepair. Um, I live very close to one of these. And so the city of Tiger is actually hoping to take ownership over of Hall Boulevard is the one I'm speaking of, but the state has to invest in getting it up to a serviceable level before the transfer can take place. So there's a bunch of issues like that as well. And yeah, I think like, like we have more questions to get to, but th there's obviously a million problems right now, a million challenges, a million opportunities. Like COVID is gonna, the COVID recovery is gonna color all, all of this. Um, I think income inequality is a lens through which I think about a lot of things. Power differentials is a lens through which I think a lot of I think about a lot of policy issues. So, I don't know. I don't want to talk too much about this. <laughs> it's I feel like people get bored if I go on too long. That was that was a lot of policy. I uh, so I also want to jump to the political side of things. And one 
Uh, I guess this is a contingent question because Republicans just filed a lawsuit against the congressional maps that came out. But from my understanding, your district would be within the new sixth congressional district. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. Okay. So, so the new yeah, it's basically Tigard and Tualatin up in the corner of it, and then it goes down. To, it goes out to Yamhill County. It goes down to Salem, and it kind of is like a almost like a teardrop shape. Okay. So uh, obviously, that will depending on who runs on both the R side and D side, uh, that has the potential to be probably one of the most competitive house district races, in like congressional districts in the country. Yeah. Uh, because 2022 is probably going to be a good year for Republicans. The district is plus four D if I'm not mistaken. So if you had a six point swing, which is totally not crazy, you would have a Republican sitting in that seat instead of a Democrat. So let's say all goes well and dandy. You win the primary, you're moving on to your general election. Uh, I'm sort of curious of how the politics works in terms of like, to me, at least, it would seem uh, your district is very much the people who need to turn out to vote to make yes. sure that the people above you basically win. Yes. Uh, whether that be Kurt Schrader, maybe it be Nick Kristoff, maybe it be someone else, uh, whoever that person is, uh, at least in my mind, your voters will be very important on the Democratic side uh, to basically helping them overcome, which will likely be a very strong Republican year. What's the sort of expectation or like, maybe not even expectation is the right word, but like, uh, what does the involvement in that process kind of look like? Like, that's something that's always uh, really curious to me. And I've, I've witnessed it on the presidential level of like, you know, certain congressmen or congresswomen will be like, oh, you know, Trump needs to perform really well in this area. So we'll send her out as a surrogate or, you know, you need to do well in this area. Uh, what does the politics kind of look like? Is that right? Because like, you really, you'll be part of a ticket slate. I mean, you're a Democrat, yeah. the person above you will be a Democrat, there'll be people below you too, who need to turn out for you, for you, both you and them to win. Uh, what does that kind of look like? That's a really good question. I actually don't know the answer to that yet. This will be my first time. My Here's my, like, I've worked on campaigns enough to kind of have a broad picture, but like, I don't know. And also, also this is this is a different situation, right? Like my my current congresswoman is Suzanne Bonamici, who's in a safe Democratic district, essentially. Um, yeah. And who's like a beloved congresswoman who like never has had serious primary or general challenge, at least since her first couple. There was there's when the seat was vacant, there was some national attention actually in CD1. Um, but that uh, I think people, especially post redistricting, that won't be the case. So a, you're going to have a very competitive general in a very, un not very, we'll see how unfavorable it is to Democrats. I, at the beginning, did not think it was going to be as unfavorable to Democrats as it's looking like it is now. Obviously, that was before the Afghanistan withdrawal and all that. So it does seem like the national environment is going to be helpful for Republicans. So I don't know. Like, I think I, I talked to one of my friends who works in national politics, who does like national political consulting, was was basically using that argument and saying like, like he wouldn't be surprised if you know there's there's like more emphasis on state legislative races within competitive um, congressional districts, providing them resources and support to actually like turn out voters. Because um, it is true, right? Like whoever the there is nobody from Tigard or Tualatin that I know of who's considering running for this congressional seat. Um, but you're right, that is like a probably the darkest blue hue of the district or among the darkest blue, that area. So like there, whoever the candidate is, is going to need to turn out the vote there um, and having support from not just legislative candidates, but like city council, mayor, um, you know, other folks on the down ballot races engaged in turning out voters. And the trick is right. Like, Let's say, again, I'm not going to knock super loud on wood because every time I do, my dog starts barking. <laughs> I, not, I did hear the dog uh, <laughs> that happened. But, but knock on wood, let's say I'm unopposed. Um, my The voters, we still need the voters to turn out. Like, like Well, because that was what I was going to say, right? If, let's say you're unopposed in the primary or if you were opposed. Yeah. And you move on to the general. Uh, you don't really have to do anything. I mean, obviously you will, but like, if I was in your shoes and I won or, you know, someone else was like, you could basically just do nothing until the general election because you're going to win no matter what. Uh, and before that may not have mattered as much because of course, uh, Congresswoman bon Bonamici, she, again, I think her district is like plus 30 D or something. So like she doesn't really have to do that much either. Right. 
But now with how competitive the district is at least shaped up to be, uh, and again, it may change with the court ruling, but even if it does change, it probably won't change that much. Uh, it would be really dramatic if there was like a total redraw of the districts, which probably won't happen. Uh, your voters will be like really important to turn out for that race. So I think that that's, uh, it's a really interesting position to be in. Whereas, you know, uh, with like Rep Graybar four years ago, let's say like, that's kind of boring for her probably, right? <laughs> Actually, I don't know how competitive her district was. Yeah. Well, if it was like, as partisan tilted as yours is, uh, there's not really much to do, at least within kind of your own boundaries. So yeah, I, think, I think that actually, that's a really interesting point. I think Reb Graber's district actually is for the, the basically the district I'm in currently was a was a good case study. Um, Dacia did have a primary opponent and she did have a general opponent. And I don't think either were per, neither were perceived as serious by most folks like they didn't win serious percentages but Dacia ran like a very real campaign she paid for mm. staff she knocked on doors she did a little bit of mail she did some digital advertising like she took the race seriously and I think I mean this is my first race so with with or without an opponent I want to run I want to run a really strong race and like like demonstrate to voters who I am what I care about um, what I want to do because part of what you're trying to do is like you're trying to build some sense of momentum for what you want to actually accomplish when you're down there. You want to build a coalition. You want to meet community yeah. members, right? Like, so, so I do think like, it'll be interesting to see if there's formal, like actual working together with the congressional campaign um, or, you know, other campaigns in the, in the area. Like I know there's some, some endorsers will do like slate card, those kinds of things, which obviously our previous guest, Reagan Canope. Um, I don't know if we actually talked about slate cards, but that is happening a lot at school board races, um, mm -hmm. across the state. So there might be stuff like that. I'm sure there will be places where we work together, but like, I, obviously my jurisdiction would be the state government, but it makes my, it makes me accomplishing my goals, um, in terms of broader social goals are, is way harder if Kevin McCarthy is speaker of the house than if Nancy Pelosi is speaker of the house, right? Like we do people and and I'm sure the same is true for you, right? Like if for it, like, as we've talked about, government interacts constantly, and there's not always clear dividing lines between who, like, whose job is income inequality, whose job is housing affordability, whose mm -hmm. job is climate change policy. Like, these are all too big for one jurisdiction. So, like, it's helpful to have alignment across governments to actually be able to make a dent on these challenges. Yeah, yeah, and even uh, and actually. Uh, when I met with Rep Walden before too, I know he he used to, he would take his races very seriously. Yeah, uh, and he spent over he I think he spent over a million dollars basically with each of them, even though he'd win by like twenty points basically yeah. each time. So, uh, yeah, I, I it can definitely vary. I know there's folks across the country. It's like basically nothing happens for the sometimes not even an opponent. <laughs> It'll be like the Libertarian versus the Republican, or like the Progressive versus the Green, or the Democrat versus the Green, or whatever. So. Uh, but yeah, that will probably be a fun experience for you, regardless if you uh, if you make it through the primary or not, because there'll be a competitive race. Uh, so I also want to talk about uh, how will your run slash your future political endeavors? Uh, how do you think that will kind of impact the podcast? Well, the first thing I'll be doing is firing you as my podcast co-host. And uh, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm released. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do think like. I want to keep doing this. I really enjoy it. There's a few other legislators who have podcasts um, that I think are really interesting. So you've got um, Rep. Daniel Bonham on the Republican side. Uh, in fact, we should we should have these folks on. Senator Betsy Johnson recently announced governor candidate. She it started as a radio show. I think like you can't get her podcast on Spotify. You can only get it on Apple Podcasts. Um, but like she basically has like a local radio show that she does um, where she just basically says like, what's what's going on? What, what are you working on? What's happening in the district? Um, so obviously our podcast won't be Tiger specific um, or district specific. Like I think what we've been focusing on is trends, the future of Oregon politics, like how to interpret national events in a local context. How do these two things interact with one another? So I want to keep having that conversation. And I also think like you know, the one phrase we've used um, and with our colleague Kevin Frazier in the sort of Oregon 360 media sphere is um, like reviving Oregon's civic culture. And I think like, I think that's a responsibility of anyone who pursues elected office is like, I mean, 
everything I've always said, I, I still believe is true. Like, I do think our civic culture is in trouble. I do think it's a shell of what it used to be. I do think, um, like, look at the Oregon Values and Belief Center data. We talked about this with Amari. Like, Oregonians are deeply pessimistic about our ability to solve big problems. That's that is a problem for all of us as a state, and it's a particular problem for our government and for the Democrats who are in charge of our government. Of I hoped, and I hope to be one. Like, I think we we need to do work to try to build a more unified culture um, in terms of our our politics and our our civic space. And that's really hard. <laughs> like, that's going to be really challenging to do. I think it's what we're trying to do here, and sometimes successfully, and sometimes not. Um, but like I, in, in some ways I do think of that goal as being aligned in the podcast space and in terms of like running to be a state legislator. Um, because I do like, we are both right now sort of on the outside looking in. Um, and if I become a legislator, like I do think I have more personal responsibility to, you know, build and build the necessary relationships, like not take destructive actions and take productive actions. And like, I'm going to I am bringing a sense of humility to this and knowing that I'm not going to be able to solve this by myself or even necessarily like with a coalition solve this quickly, but I do like, it is something that's going, it has been on my mind. It will be on my mind. And like, um, I think my ability to talk to you um, every week in this space. And then also, you know, we obviously are, have as many Republicans as Democrats on this podcast. Um, and I think having this space for me to hear from them and ask them questions from a place of curiosity and not from a place of like, you know, gotcha or attacking or whatever. I, I think it's going to, I think it's helpful. And I think it all kind of is going to work together in a, in a helpful way. I hope. Ben, well, thanks again for, for taking the time to do this. Uh, as we do with all of our guests, uh, we will now do it for you. Where can people <laughs> find you if they want to look at your policy positions, they want to learn more about your campaign. Uh, maybe they want to volunteer. Maybe they want to endorse you too. You've been getting quite a few of those. So uh, where can they go and do that? You have no idea how prepared I am for this question. <laughs> <laughs> www.benfororegon.com. That's Ben for F-O-R Oregon.com. Um, that's my I was website. Gonna say, I was going to say, if you didn't, if you didn't give the, uh, the detail there, what type of four it was, <laughs> you were, you were in big trouble. So. I should buy the other domain, but I probably won't. Um, but yeah, I mean, Candidly, the best and most helpful thing anyone can do at this stage of not just my race, but any candidate you support is to donate money. Um, $50, $100, $250, however much you can afford, $5. Um, right now, people, again, we're not like talking to voters in most races. I don't think I haven't heard of anyone who's talking to voters right now. So we're really just trying to build a strong campaign structure and raise some funds. So if you support my, my race for the state legislature and you'd like to see me as a state representative i really appreciate your support you can donate on my website otherwise i'm on twitter at uh it's at ben bowman which is awesome i was an early adopter of twitter so i got a great handle <laughs> um and my instagram is at ben for oregon and uh, i post pretty frequently on um on instagram so that's a great place to follow me as well uh but yeah thanks for interviewing me uh alex and uh, i can't wait till someday we can turn the tables and i can grill you yeah, and we will. I will definitely have to interview your Republican opponent because uh, <laughs> they will need all of the free media attention they can get uh, for that race. So, uh, Ben, thanks for for taking the time, everybody. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, if you make sure to hit the subscribe button, and if your platform allows, uh, please give us five stars and also leave a comment or uh, leave a review. We love reading those. And uh, actually, our most active comments we've been getting are on YouTube. There's multiple of those every week, which is fun. And we are also on YouTube. Uh, if you just type in the name of the podcast, you will find us on YouTube. Uh, you can watch the beautiful videos and our our lovely faces, uh, including this wonderful T-shirt that I have on right now. And we would so. be remiss if we didn't give a shout out to our producer, Buddy Terry, who continues to like go above and beyond the role of podcast producer to put together these like really cool videos um, in addition to you know, editing the audio, which listeners won't be able to hear this, but even during this episode, there were a couple places where we had to pause and say, well, what are you going to ask next? Those kinds of things. So buddy, thanks so much for taking the, the time and putting the effort into making this product come across as professional to the extent possible with me and Alex running it. Awesome. Thanks everyone. <laughs>